until the pandemic came and hit us, I think a lot of people were not quite so aware as to how much our lives are impacted by global events that might start anywhere. This is a real crisis. I mean, it's been clear that this was likely to spread in the U.S. We need to be thinking much more ambitiously. Climate finance is a very big issue. We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. CGD came about because it was time to focus not only on what developing countries should do, but much more on what the rich world should do. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? Some of our previous work has helped to come up with a kind of innovative financing mechanism that was used to help launch pneumococcal vaccines. We really have researchers and experts here at CGD who come at these issues from multiple vantage points, and I think that's just what helps make our research more rigorous, more rich, and actually more connected to the realities that decision makers are grappling with. We've been looking to CGD for all of your research and analysis uh, to guide us. So CGD is nonpartisan. Because of that, over the years, that credibility has given us significant convenient power. Our government highly values the work. What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. Every single time that we're able to get it right, it means you know, we're reducing significant poverty. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's so nice to have a group of you here with us in person today. It's been a little while. Uh, and many more joining us online virtually. I'm Megan O'Donnell. I'm one of the directors of the Gender Equality Program here at CGD. And I'm very pleased to be hosting today's conversation. For those of you that have followed our work over the past few years, you'll know that under our COVID-19 Gender and Development Initiative, uh, supported by the Gates Foundation, we brought together a lot of evidence confirming that the COVID crisis disproportionately impacted women from an economic perspective. It's still an ongoing effort to make sure that policymakers and other global decision makers not only recognize, but also take appropriate action to address those widening gender gaps. And that effort is now especially challenging in light of compounding crises, whether we're thinking about food insecurity or rising debt or the threat of climate change, all of which evidence suggests will also have disproportionate consequences for women and girls in low and middle income countries. It's becoming clear that we need a new paradigm, one that doesn't position gender equality and inclusion as side issues or nice to haves in light of those compounding crises, but rather central to how global decision makers decide to address things like food insecurity, environmental degradation, or macroeconomic instability. And we know that's a tall order. Uh, so today we're going to try to think short term and think specific. And why we're here is to discuss what G7, G20 and APEC decision makers can do in the short term, in 2023, to make sure that gender equality doesn't fall off of leaders' agendas, but rather is elevated within them. We're going to be begin today with a recording. Uh, when she was here just a few days ago, I sat down with Stephanie Cobus Campbell, the Australian ambassador for gender equality, to make sure that we could bring her perspective into today's conversation. And then after the recording, I'm going to welcome onto the stage Samantha Hung, who is chief of the gender equality thematic group at the Asian Development Bank, Ratna Sahai, who for one more day is the senior advisor on gender in the office of the managing director at the International Monetary Fund, and last but not least, Rachel Vogelstein, 
who is both the special assistant to the president through the White House Gender Policy Council and also sits on the U.S. National Security Council as the special advisor on gender. And the four of us are going to keep the conversation going together. Uh, but for now, let's bring up the recording and then we'll get started in conversation. Ambassador, what are Australia's priorities for promoting women's economic security? Yeah, well, first of all, we recognize women's economic security is key. It's a key pillar of what we do through our development cooperation program, through our engagement in trade, in foreign policy. And it's important for every aspect of gender equality. When a woman earns an income, she's better off and has more choices. Her children are healthier. Her children tend to be more educated. So removing barriers so that she can meet her economic potential as she chooses to do so is absolutely essential. So within that, we look at, first of all, what barriers we need to lift. So it may be access to education, ensuring that she has access to education, that she has access to financial means such as banking, for example. So a lot of the countries in which we work through our development cooperation program, women are living in very remote areas of the country. And in doing so, they may not have access to banking. They may not have access to other financial securities, such as a basic loan to start a business. So ensuring that women can meet those financial needs in terms of banking, other aspects of, of loans, et cetera, really, really, really important. So we spend a lot of effort um, finding out what um, our communities want in terms of economic opportunities for women and girls. And once we understand what that looks like, then we work to design programs with them to enable full access to lifting barriers and full access to every opportunity that they may want. As we think about how to promote an inclusive recovery mm. from the COVID mm. crisis, mm. 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 And in light of how much evidence demonstrates women have really disproportionately shouldered yep, a have. lot of those economic mm, impacts, mm. what do you see as the short-term priorities to yeah. get those gender caps yeah. uh, narrowed and, yeah. and women back on track? Yeah. So the first is, I think, first and foremost, it's really understanding and being able to articulate what that impact is. And I think in some cases we know it and there's some pretty good data, but I'm not sure we have the complete evidence we need to argue that at every single stage. So I think continuing to collect that evidence of what the impact is and also what lifting any barriers and getting back women back into the workforce into um, a, a situation where they can return to work safely, where they have access to childcare, where they can um, ensure that they're entering where they may have left off and there's full opportunities. Ensuring all of that is really essential, but it's making the argument and providing the evidence of why that's so important and so essential for women, for business, for the economy. And um, the more evidence we have, the more we can argue for those opportunities and for funding to be directed towards that. Um, ensuring that women have access to um, childcare is another really critical, critical um, gap and, and need. And it was really interesting when we had, at least in Australia, um, during COVID, we found out that a lot of the essential services were female dominated. So you had nurses, you had cleaners, um, you had you know, the health sector more generally, you had aged care, for example, which was huge. And then all of a sudden understanding for women to get to work, particularly when we had the pandemic and people were at home, to understand that when women, um, for them to get to work, they needed childcare. And so, being able to ensure there was access to free childcare during that period was absolutely essential. But of course, we see that right across um, the countries in which we work and which we partner. Women need safe um, access to work, but they also need to be able to um, lift those barriers for who's caring for their children and um, ensuring that then they can they can contribute through work, um, both paid and, and non-paid work as well, which is essential in everywhere that we that we work and we live. Absolutely. Yeah. The Australian government will come together with others mm -hmm. through a number of different convenings mm -hmm. this coming mm -hmm. year, the mm -hmm. G20 summit, mm -hmm. the Absolutely. APEC summit. Absolutely. What are the top priorities for you 
to yeah. advance women's economic security yeah. through those fora. Yeah. Well, it's really working again with like-minded countries. It's ensuring that we have one voice on why this is important. Mm -hmm. It's again ensuring that we have the evidence to back that up. So I keep coming back to evidence, mm -hmm. but that's so very, very important. So being able to work with women to ensure that we have um, financial security is really important and how that nexus with climate is um, really, really important. But on climate change, more generally, I often say, first and foremost, we really need to include um, women and girls across the board because these problems are, are so challenging and they're so threatening and they're so existential that we need 100% of our population and 100% of our talent thinking about it. So enabling women to have, you know, access to opportunities where they can contribute to these really difficult challenge in global problems is so very essential. Um, and not to mention how they should be involved in and have opportunities to work within that climate change space um, in terms of technology driven solutions, um, etc. So that's really important. All hands on deck needed. Yes, all hands on deck, 100%. Well, Ambassador, it has been a pleasure uh, to hear your perspectives you. and learn more about your priorities on this Thank critical issue. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. All right, so it's a bit unorthodox to go from watching yourself on screen to shifting <laughs> back to the stage. Um, but hopefully, uh, the Ambassador's remarks sets the foundation for the rest of our conversation together. Uh, Rachel would love to start with you because we just heard the articulation of Australia's priorities on women's economic security. What are the Biden administration's priorities? We heard her talk about childcare, uh, about the intersection with climate. Are those aligned? Would you add anything? Um, well, first, thank you for having me here. Thank you for hosting this discussion, and it's terrific to be with my fellow co-panelists as well. Um, we actually had a chance to sit down with the ambassador when she was here earlier this week and so have a tremendous amount of commonality between what you just heard her talk about and what we're focused on. In fact, we had a convening on childcare specifically uh, and the care economy and how we can partner together, um, something that we are already working on uh, now for several years. Um, but I'll take a step back in answering your question. Uh, to reflect that women's economic security has been a priority for the administration since the beginning. Uh, so really in early days, President Biden issued an executive order creating the Gender Policy Council and also importantly, mandating the creation of our first ever national strategy on gender equity and equality, which outlines 10 strategic priorities, the first of which is advancing women's economic participation. And uh, since that time, we have worked to create our first ever interagency strategy on global women's economic security, which was unveiled earlier this year by Secretary of State Antony Blinken and U.S. State Administrator Samantha Power, which expands upon uh, what we included in the national strategy in greater detail. Uh, and there are three issues in particular that I would highlight that we are focused on as we head into this year, the G upcoming G7 summit, uh, you mentioned uh, APEC, which the U.S. is privileged to host this year, and of course the G20 summit as well. Uh, and those uh, three issues are advancing care infrastructure and valuing domestic work, uh, promoting digital inclusion, and also ensuring women's access to well-paying jobs in the green and blue economies, so the climate piece that you were talking about with the ambassador. Um, with respect to APEC, I want to note that our focus on women's economic participation is longstanding. So I think back to the Obama administration uh, when under then Secretary Hillary Clinton, uh, the APEC Women in the Economy Forum was born uh, back uh, in uh, the 2010-2011 uh, time period. And ever since then, the APEC Forum has hosted a Women in the Economy Forum, and there will be no exception this year. We will look forward to hosting that uh, later this year uh, at the end of the summer. And we look forward to building on the San Francisco Declaration that was what came out of that first ever Women in the Economy Forum, which focused in particular on women's entrepreneurship and access to markets and to meet the needs of the moment, some of which you talked about, it, Megan, in your opening remarks and, and with the Australian ambassador as well, uh, responding to the moment that we're in, uh, the gaps that have been exacerbated during COVID, 
uh, and some of the, the challenges uh, that we face now. Uh, so to that end, we'll be focused in all of those fora, but including at APEC, on strengthening the care economy. And that's work that we've already begun. The US uh, has been really privileged to work together with a number of partners, the Australians, of course, but also the German government, the Canadian government, uh, the World Bank, importantly, and uh, private donors as well, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to create an, an initiative, the Invest in Child Care Initiative, that's housed at the bank and is really focused on catalyzing investment in infrastructure, care infrastructure, in low and middle income economies. Um, for the reasons that you've written about many times uh, and that we all know, which is that just as roads and bridges are critical to get to work, so too is the care infrastructure that we rely on. And that's particularly true for women who we know uh, are uh, shouldered with the disproportionate burden of caregiving responsibilities. Um, so we're pleased to be working on that partnership. We're hoping to grow that partnership and bring additional partners on uh, and also thinking about ways in which we can expand that work into our private sector approaches as well. We're also focused on closing the digital gender gap. And I'm just back from the Commission on the Status of Women uh, convening in New York, uh, where on the margins we announced a new partnership that is squarely focused on accelerating progress towards closing the digital gender gap, a gap that we know is more uh, important to address than ever in this COVID economy where there is so much economic activity happening online. And we know that, uh, according to some reports, that the gap has increased during this COVID moment uh, between men and women in terms of access and usage of the internet. So we are partnering with the Gates Foundation once again on that initiative uh, and expect to have more to say later this month about what the US commitment to that will be and of course extremely interested in partnering with others on that work as well. And then finally I'll mention the, the climate issues that you referenced. Um, you know, we know that women and girls are disproportionately affected by climate change in significant ways um, when it comes to food insecurity or water scarcity, that women are less likely to have resources, uh, emergency savings uh, as compared to men, uh, that gender-based violence uh, can be an effect of many of the climate crises we're seeing. Um, and also that despite the fact that women are often the lead voices when it comes to environmental stewardship, that they're not always at the table where these decisions are made in terms of how to respond to the crisis. Um, so we are, are focused on putting a gender lens on the work that we're doing to address the climate crisis and in particular focused on women's access to jobs in the green and blue economies, recognizing that these are the jobs of the future, um, that these are often well-paying jobs and making sure that women have access is a priority. So that's something we expect to continue to do work on and, and are really eager to partners with others on as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I will say already it is exciting and encouraging for me to hear alignment between what you just shared with our audience and what the ambassador emphasized as well. You know, gender equality and even the economic security aspects of it can be so broad, far reaching. You know, there's so many different components that it can be tough unless there's prioritization and alignment, you know, among key governments and decision makers around aspects of it to really sort of drive in the short term. Uh, so to hear both of you reflect on care, digital, and climate, and green jobs within it, as you mentioned, as sort of core priorities for the short term, means we may have an opportunity to really get some stuff done, right, in, in the next year on those areas. I want to bring in you, Sam, next. Sure. Obviously, there is also a geographic focus to these upcoming summits, right, and it's really going to be in your neighborhood of the mm -hmm. world where a lot of these things happen with the G7 presidency in Japan, G20 presidency in India, and of course the US uh, leading the, the APEC group. So with the Asian Development Bank uh, as a leader in sort of bringing that policy dialogue down into the operations, the implementation, the change on the ground, where do you see the priorities for this year uh, coming down and aligning with your current work? 
Yeah, I mean, thank you. First of all, it's a real pleasure to be here as well. So thank you for inviting and organising and, and, and meeting um, my fellow panellists. I think, you know, when you talk about alignment and the same issues, I think we all have similar alignment, but we're bringing it down to a multilateral development bank, bank perspective. So I won't repeat some of the things that have been, been said already, but I think a lot of, of what we've been hearing and I think the general conversations that Stephanie are having, you know, we're seeing multiple crises and we're seeing a lot of dialogue about all these multiple crises. But the attention to gender within them is still largely at the periphery. So I think we've got to keep sort of pushing to make it make it central, um, and and bring gender, you know, to the to the centre of that conversation. And the, the different ways of, of doing that, um, the evidence is really crucial. I mean, as Stephanie said, you know, I, we we supported quite a lot of work during the the pandemic response, looking at, you know, working on, on the gender impacts and, and in terms of particular sectors, as well as across the board. And that was really crucial. But I think now we need to build on that to sort of bring it into these conversations. So if I could just probably the, the best example and most one where we're probably most involved is in relation to G20 processes. So last year, we were very closely involved with Indonesia, um, um, particularly around the organization of the, of the gender ministerial conference. And we supported the development of several um, policy papers to feed into that. And so this year, and, and, and those at that time, they focused on, on similar themes, just care, entrepreneurship. Um, and this year, uh, the government of India has also approached ADB to across a range of priorities, but one of which is the theme of women-led development. So we're in early conversations with them about what that will look like. Um, but recently I attended the, the first sort of um, engagement group, women engagement group, W20 uh, inception meeting, and I spoke on a panel on gender and climate. Um, and so our role in that process will be sort of at two levels, uh, supporting the Sherpas track in terms of thinking of, of what kind of um, key initiatives at that policy level that we can try to bring in at the leaders level, but then also working to help the Ministry of Women and Child Development bring bring together the, the various streams of the W20 engagement group, the Empower group, and the ministerial process. So, so our role is in response to demand, helping to, to try to um, give technical advice to help frame the policy discussion, um, but also at the same time bringing in our own views into the process technically. So I think that it's some lessons to be learned from that. I think it's important that with all these processes that um, the gender voice is at the right table, but also across all the different tables. And I think with the, the G20 process, there's so many different working groups um, and so many different engagement groups, and they all have a gender angle. So you know we need to make sure that, that, that there is coordination across the board. And I think this year, the government of India is, is quite front-footed with that. So they're working with UN Women to, to actually bring gender expertise into the Sherpa's office and look at all the paper papers coming through. And that, that's really important. I think um, the, the positive spillovers that come with, with this kind of uh, dialogue, both in-country and regionally, is really important. So um, last year, some of the engagement in the G20 processes had positive spillover effects around some of the our other work, our other programming work. So for example, we've been working a lot in Indonesia through policy-based lending um, on financial inclusion, so through a financial inclusion loan. And we support the government of Indonesia on a women's financial inclusion um, strategy, which then, you know, once you have that hook, that leads to other spillover effects in terms of the guidelines and the data and the, the regulatory provisions that need to work. So then having that at programmatic level and having the similar conversations at G20 level is quite powerful. I think looking forward, um, you know, without preempting anything, I think it's really important with these kinds of platforms to get in uh, very concrete, concrete action um, and, and been providing the technical advice of what governments could consider. So, um, I mean, rewinding a bit to, to the uh, Gene 20 process back, you know, almost 10 years ago when um, during the Australia presidency in 2014 when they put the 25 by 25 sort of action, that was an example of a really good target around women's economic security. So I think that, you know, we get to need to get creative about what kind of really concrete action we can start to, to think about putting in. And, and, you know, the green jobs piece is, is really crucial. We need to prepare women to be um, ahead of the curve in terms of the green skills and the digital skills for the jobs of the future. So I would personally would like to see something around that. Um, and, and obviously also uh, bringing the sort of the, the climate and the economic piece together. For our region, even before 
um, the COVID pandemic, we already saw declining female labor force participation rates. So you can imagine the compounding effect of all that. And, and clearly the, the care economy is one big barrier. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there for now. Excellent. Thanks. No, I really appreciate you bringing in the Brisbane commitment, mm -hmm. this 25 by 25 focus on women's labor force per participation. And as we have all mentioned COVID now, you know, it's very clear that that backsliding is going to necessitate maybe a doubling down on that commitment and thinking about how it applies to specific sectors mm -hmm. where we see opportunity and high growth, like, like the green and blue jobs <coughs> that Rachel mentioned. So opportunity there for a leader statement commitment. Let's see. Um, Rotten, I wanna stick with you a talk Indian G20 this year as well, because sitting at the IMF, you've already been engaged in some of the empower conversations that Sam referenced uh, and advising them. What do you see as promising that's already on the Indian president's agenda? What do you think is missing that we need to double down on? Great, thank you very much, Megan, for having me here. It's wonderful to be with Rachel and Samantha, especially meeting them in person. <laughs> I've engaged with them before. So, so I was at the G20 Empower, you were at the W20 uh, in, in, in Agra in, in February. And uh, <clears throat> what I can say, and from what I observed, is Prime Minister Modi's is, uh, government is prioritizing women's economic empowerment and literally seeking to shift the focus from women development to, as you said, Samantha, women led development. And that is a key theme of this uh, G20's presidency. And uh, this goal is, of course, very ambitious, we know, but it is the right one. And this is really true empowerment. Why? Because now you're going to think about treating women not as victims, right, but actually the force of change. And they have three components. Uh, that they have highlighted. So first is, and it resonates a lot with what you have said, uh, one is promoting women's leadership. The third is, and, and this leadership, by the way, cuts across the private sector, public sector, and the political sphere at the grassroots level too. Uh, women's entrepreneurship, and that is a win-win for equity and growth, and digital skilling. Uh, and this is across all sectors as engines of growth. Now, it is also key, they recognize, to achieving the SDGs uh, because the, women cuts across many, many, many areas in driving digital transformation and in giving impetus also to green development. So this is all very promising. So uh, what is missing? Uh, what I can say is that what is missing so far, but I'm sure it's going to get there very quickly, is a focus on the means of how to achieve these goals. And I'm going to make three points on that. So the first is, I, I can't overemphasize this, but there is really a need to foster a much wider acceptance of gender equality by providing solid evidence, as the ambassador mentioned and both of you mentioned, that, and this is the key, that it is not just a woman's issue. It benefits everybody. And this is what we are focusing on at the IMF, okay? And the second thing, which, you know, comes from the first, really, is there is a need to get more men at the table, okay? Uh, and. As you said, I'm, I'm going to be leaving soon. So at the IMF now, it's going to be Rishi Goyal, uh, a man who's going to lead uh, the strategy and the implementation. Uh, and as we all know, the influential policymakers in the world are still predominantly men. Mm -hmm. And more concretely, what I would like to offer is that this means that mainstreaming gender should also be part of the G20 finance work, work stream, okay? Uh, third is in order to get there, you need to identify and begin, start to begin removing barriers and that's where some concrete uh, action commitments should come. 
And this comes across, and, the, and these are you know, really common across many most countries uh, in some form. And, and I would characterize them as those that relate to unequal access to education, to health, to real assets, to financial assets. That's number one. Number two, uh, that many of you feel, um, here and elsewhere feel very passionately about, which is the deficit in the care economy, and also the informal sector. Third is the legal impediments, of course, not just in written laws, but in practice. And I see Thea, who's going uh, from the World Bank, who's actually going to be looking at the laws in practice. So good for you, Thea. Uh, fourth, you know, gender-based violence. Rachel, you touched upon that. It's it's uh, to me, it was shocking to know that 50% of women interviewed, surveyed, uh, you know, during the COVID crisis, said that they were either subjected themselves or they knew somebody who was subjected to violence. I mean, that should turn everybody's head uh, and get them to do something. And finally, and this is a tough one, but I want to put this at the table uh, because I see many leaders actually doing that uh, in very conservative uh, uh, societies, and that is addressing the cultural, social, and the religious norms. So let me stop there. Excellent. All right, very ambitious, but I especially appreciate you mentioning this need for more men in leadership positions on this issue. So we are very excited to see Rishi named as your successor at the fund, and also making this relevant and prominent on the Minister of Finance agenda. Um, if I can provide a bit of a sneak preview for our audience, as Ratna steps down from her position in the office of the Managing Director at the IMF, we are very excited in the coming weeks to have official approval of her uh, as a non-resident fellow here at CGD, Thank where you. she will uh, continue to be a champion on these issues and make sure uh, that ministers of finance, central bank governors, those for too long thought their issues were gender neutral, um, hear, hear your call and the call we're discussing today. Thank you. Rachel, I want to get back to, to bring you into this conversation and maybe dive a bit deeper into uh, this opportunity around care infrastructure. Because you mentioned this new pooled financing mechanism, the World Bank's Invest in Child Care Initiative. Uh, and we have representatives from the governments of Germany and Australia and Canada who have also contributed as sort of the first movers from the bilateral side to complement the philanthropic funding that's also been, been contributed. How do you see continuing to sort of beat that drum, make sure that other governments recognize the criticality of this issue and take action, you know, follow your lead? Well, first, I want to make sure to emphasize, and we do this through all of our work at the Gender Policy Council, um, that this is an issue we're addressing at home and abroad. So all of the 10 strategic priorities we outlined, we know we have work to do here, mm -hmm. just as at the same time we're working in partnership with others on these issues globally, and that is true for care infrastructure as well. So under this administration, the president has really championed this issue. Um, you know, many examples, certainly this was a key part of our own COVID economic recovery package here, uh, and I'm really pleased that our recent fiscal year 24 budget proposal that the president just sent forward has kind of historic record levels um, of investment or calls for that investment in childcare. Um, we know it's important to our own economy and we know it's important to the global economy. So that is why we are so gratified to be in partnership with the Germans, the Canadians, the Australians, uh, the Gates Foundation and, and many others on the work we're doing together with the World Bank. Um, but we're hoping to grow that. We're hoping to bring additional partners to the table. Many of the multilateral four you mentioned are opportunities for us to continue to expand this circle and to elevate this on the international agenda. You know, we are certainly doing that uh, through our efforts uh, multilaterally and bilaterally. Uh, multilaterally, uh, we're now part of the Global Alliance for Care and are working with partners uh, through that alliance to elevate this issue, um, and bilaterally have programs through the U.S. Agency for International Development, through the State Department, that are squarely focused on this issue. Um, so we will continue to beat this drum and to bring others into the conversation, and we hope 
uh, to grow the partnership that exists. And as I mentioned earlier, to start to think about catalyzing investment in the private sector as well. Um, we've seen that on the domestic side uh, with a recent CHIPS announcement that requires childcare to be part of uh, government funding under that important program. And so we're really eager to be in conversation with partners about all of the ways in which we can advance this as the critical economic priority as that it is. Excellent, thank you. And then I'll, I'll bring Sam in on this same question. <laughs> yeah, because we've got to go from policy down yeah. to the sort of nuts and bolts of how things get done. Can you tell us a bit about what the ADB is already doing yeah. on the issue of care child care or, or more broadly, and what opportunities you see Go going forward. forward to start to scale these things up, yeah. Sure, um, so we've had a, a kind of multi-sectoral approach to addressing unpaid care work for some time. So women's time poverty and unpaid care has been part of our sort of gender operational plan strategy for some time, and that's really a, a recognition that um, women in Asia, if you combine their, their uh, paid and unpaid work, actually work the longest hours. And so, and that clearly has detrimental effects on all kinds of things. Um, livelihoods, ability to join the labor market, um, e education opportunities, overall well-being, and, and um, the works. Um, and so we've seen our infrastructure investments and in things such as um, water supply, transport, and energy as a way to actually directly address women's time property. Um, but in more recent years, um, particularly yeah, with, the, with the COVID pandemic, putting care, more of a spotlight on the care, we are also pivoting to increasingly address this issue. So I'll talk about sort of three main ways that we are doing this. So, so firstly, in terms of knowledge, um, we recognize that there is a real knowledge gap to really understand the issue in the region. So we have been working with the ILO, UNDP on UNRIST, or UNRICD um, acronym. Um, we've been working with them on a regional child care study. Um, which, so it's a regional analysis as well as deep dive in, in some countries um, for more in-depth insights into the, the policy entry points, infrastructure and investment gaps on child care provision. So that report will come out soon and we hope that that will give us a platform for guiding um, potential future work with, with member governments, but also for policy, policy dialogue. Um, the second area is in terms of our concrete lending and investments. Um, we, again, we work in response to country requests, but we have been working in countries such as Sri Lanka, Vietnam and, and China on lending and technical support to force integrated solutions. That's tended to be more on elderly care services um, in recognition of the demographic. But we are also working with India on, um, on a, a state-of-the-art type um, quality and affordable childcare provision initiative. And so we see this as a, as a growth area in our portfolio across the board in response to demand. And the third would be in terms of policy dialogue, and I think that's really crucial, um, and, and, and the policy support that comes with that. So for example, in, um, we're, we've been working with some countries to develop guidelines and policies at national level on care. So for example, in, in China, we're working to support their um, expansion for the very young age of zero to two. And in Tonga, we've been working, um, helping the government to carry out assessments on the sector to strengthen um, related skills development and work opportunities in that sector. Um, in Maldives, quite recently, we're also working with the government to sort of help them develop a policy on childcare and elderly care, which is a first, which they will then use to build into their medium term. So that's what we've been doing. Did you want me to get into what we need? <laughs> what, what else we need to go? What can we do in 2023? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we we don't um, we don't have a facility as such per se, but we we're definitely really keen to work um, and join forces with our other development partners. Um, and we definitely need to keep bringing it onto the table for policy dialogue. So G20 is one example. But one thing that we've been doing and we want to see more of is we have uh, at ADB um, our Asia Development Fund, which is basically um, a grant window for less developed countries. And um, for the first time in 2019, there was an SDG5 window created within that to really encourage more investment in, in SDG5 areas such as unpaid care. 
So that's um, been quite, uh, it's, been, it's quite, been quite pivotal for us in terms of new projects and really bringing unpaid care um, into our pipeline. So we've had some really exciting projects in Maldives, Kyrgyz and Cambodia, for example. So we'd like to see a lot more scaling up of that. And we need the sort of resources behind it. And it really does boil down to, as you say, a social norms type approach, um, building in. So, you know, we're actually sh shifting the division of labor at home. Um, and so we see, yeah, I think we need, we need more resources to do it, but we also need it on the policy dialogue and it needs to really become part of a, a coalition of thought to bring this onto, onto the agenda. Stop there. We will offer ourselves <laughs> as coalition partners, many in this room. Um, Ratna, I want to make sure we have time for, for questions and comments from the audience, but to bring in the fund, you know, in, in many ways your organization yeah, at this point, your organization um, has done so much to generate the type of data and evidence and analysis that positions these gender and the economy issues as macro-critical, as relevant to those broader macroeconomic conversations. But in other ways, you are really just getting started, right, with this past year having seen the first ever board-approved gender strategy. Um, so how do you see the fund's role in collaborating with G7, G20, APEC leaders uh, in making sure that this, this agenda is promoted and accelerated. Thank you, Megan. As you rightly pointed out, our, our, we produced our first ever gender strategy in July of last year. And I want to thank you again, Megan, because uh, it was first launched publicly uh, due to your initiative, and we are really delighted uh, it was received uh, really well by, by uh, our partners. So what this really means is, is, is it's really big because it means 190 member countries have endorsed this mandate. What is this mandate? This mandate is to apply a gender lens to all our activities. We, we have a very ambitious vision to our surveillance, to our lending, to our capacity development. Of course, it is in those countries where gender disparities, as you said, are macro critical. And you know, just to s explain in one word, it simply means that if gender disparities are large and they are reduced, uh, there are a number of macroeconomic benefits for economies, for the people, in terms of higher economic growth, lower inequality, greater financial stability that we care a lot about at the IMF. And so, so on, your, on your question of, uh, you know, how do you see us partnering, uh, let me say that our strongest and the most important partner are the country authorities themselves, right? Uh, so we, uh, our plan is to work very closely with them. What do I mean? Uh, you know, we have four pillars, and, and there are uh, uh, two of the pillars that we have, and I'll talk about that, is addresses the question that you raise. So a key pillar is to set up a robust governance framework inside the IMF and a supportive internal organizational structure so that we make steady pro pro progress in implementing our strategy. Now, because we have some way to go on filling data gaps, honing our uh, quantitative tools, and also because of limited resources, we are going to focus on a few countries every year. And uh, there's, a, there's a systematic criteria by which uh, these countries will be determined. We've already uh, launched into the first year, now looking into the next year. And uh, uh, there's a guidance note that's being produced for our teams, how to do that. So, so that's all uh, uh, in train, and we've made steady progress. Uh, we are also going to use appropriate occasions to engage with the G70, the G20, the APEC, uh, because they're all part of the IMF and they've made certain commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm happy to note that this internal structure and process has already been set up. Now, the other point is with regard to the pillar, the second pillar that I wanted to talk about, on, which was on external partners, uh, here, the aim of the strategy is to establish modalities of collaboration uh, to benefit from knowledge sharing and peer le learning because of the reason that you mentioned that, you know, we are new to the game. There's a lot for us to learn. 
Uh, we've already done that. This was a big part of the job I was doing, uh, was to establish some modality of engagement with about 35 institutions, uh, which include MDBs, also UN agencies, and I'm happy to report, Asian Development Bank mm -hmm. is one of them, and so is CGD. Uh, and why is this needed? Also because, uh, not just because we are uh, new entrants, but, you know, and we, and we did do a lot of work actually since uh, the mid-2015, uh, but we're all bringing it together now, is because the solutions are not generic, and they really need to be tailored and designed at the country specific to have maximum impact. Uh, and uh, the way we are going to be working with them, and this is the last point I, I want to make, and I'll tell you an example because we're going to focus on, on, on the macro financial aspects and leave it to the others on the, the micro, the more sectoral issues. Uh, so suppose we, in our analysis, find that increasing female labor force participation is macro critical. I mean, it's obvious, you know. Mm -hmm. um, not just because it, incre it increases potential growth, let me add, but it also increases productivity. Uh, so we at the IMF can advise countries based on that, that they really need to uh, bring down the barriers or reinforce, for example, let's say child and elderly care facilities. Mm -hmm. But then how to design those facilities is not the IMF's job. So that's where the partners come in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now that's excellent to hear that reinforcement of the need for the micro and the macro to be speaking to one yeah. another yeah. to make sure the policies are mm -hmm. informed by that good evidence and data. And also that in between these touch points, these summits that we can use to amplify the agenda, the work is going to be done at country level by institutions mm -hmm. like the fund and the ADB mm -hmm. to make sure the drumbeat continues. We've got a few minutes, so I'm turning to all of you now. Um, I want to start first with okay. Ali Hafley, who is representing the Government of Canada. We should have a mic for you in just yeah, one second. Mm -hmm. And then others, please do raise your hands uh, if you're interested in making a comment or asking a question to our speakers. to thank everyone for coming out today, including our distinguished panel and the representatives from the US, Australia, and Germany. Um, let's see. Uh, to speak on the care economy, we're glad for the opportunity to connect with our, um, on our collective work, and we look forward to continuing productive discussions on these key issues. Care work is a priority for the government of Canada, and we see addressing issues in paid and unpaid care as essential for, con um, for, sorry, <laughs> for accomplishing the sustainable development goals um, in, from gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls to decent work and inclusive growth. That's mm -hmm. why at the Gender Equality Forum in 2021, Prime Minister Trudeau announced $100 million in new funding for standalone projects to address issues in paid and unpaid care work in low and middle income countries where Canada um, provides international assistance. So thank you. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, I was just speaking with Karen Moore at Global Affairs Canada last week and very excited to hear some of the concrete ways that that 100 million is being mobilized um, and also how its impact is going to be tracked because I think it can serve as a model for others to emulate hopefully going forward. Other questions or comments from the floor or maybe from online out there? Wendy. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Wendy Telegi from um, the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative at the World Bank. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to um, thank you all for uh, your great remarks. Um, these issues on care and climate are important to all of us, and we hear that from our donors and our implementing partners. I wanted to ask a little bit um, on climate. I was just up in New York. We were meeting with the UA team, UAE team on COP to see how we could integrate more gender initiatives into the work that COP is doing on climate. Um, and this is very important because women are not just the most affected by climate change, but also we believe that they should be really leading us through the climate transition. And we don't want to end up 10 years from now and see all of the new green industries led by men. 
We want to see more women at the, at the lead of those organizations. And we think that finance is an important part of that, um, important part of the whole climate discussion, but including gender. We're not just trying to get more women represented in committees, but we really want to get women empowered with finance. Um, and I wanted to get your take because it's you know in the news today and it's been in the news for a while. We've been working a lot with many of you and people in the room on getting banks to focus more on women and financing women um, and gathering data from banks to make sure there's transparency about how many women they're financing. Um, but we see a backlash now on ESG. Uh, first of all, we don't see a lot on gender and ESG. We see a lot more on environment, but then there's a backlash on ESG. And in the news recently, there's you know discussions about whether uh, it's the woke bankers that have uh, led to the current chaos in the financial markets. So I wanted to get your sense on the importance of um, gender and financing, and especially as we move into the green transition, and how can governments, policymakers, and MDBs do more to accelerate and not backslide on finance for women. Thank you so much, Wendy. Sam, do you want to start and we'll go down the line? <laughs> she hosted a conversation on gender and climate just this morning. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Wendy. That, that's a, a really big question. And, and I guess there's several layers to that question. So I think, again, from an MDP perspective, I mean, we, as you know, Asian Development Bank has made um, commitments at the highest level to what we call our twin targets, climate uh, targets on gender equality, but also on um, climate. So, and in very broad terms, that 75% of what we do across the board, public and and private, will directly support gender equality, but also directly support climate. So that that requires some sort of close um, intertwining and synergy between those in terms of the solutions we offer, both in, in, in all our operations, um, and. It also for us requires concrete targets at project level. And so I guess that gets to the, the second part of your question in terms of, of how we work in, in our financing. Because we have these corporate level targets, we have to have mechanisms to operationalize that. And that means that at, at, um, at every kind of project design, you, you have to have the targets there and you have to have the resourcing behind it in order to implement it. Because also we also, um, I think we're the only multilateral development bank that actually also measures um, the results, gender results at the end. So that requires then accountability in terms of implementation and there has to be some resourcing behind it. But I think it also goes down to, you know, we're seeing so much growth in proliferation of, of climate financing in different platforms. It also requires us, and, and that's something we're experiencing as an institution, our climate work is really ramping up. How do we make sure that we bake in the financing for gender within that at design? And one um, good example of that is our new Community Resiliency Partnership Program, or CRPP, which is really focused, meant to, um, the intent behind it is to uh, mobilize financing and support for community-led adaptation, which takes into account the nexus of poverty, gender, and climate. And we've managed um, in the design of that large program to have a dedicated women-focused investment window. Um, and so that will require then working with women's organizations and, 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 and uh, generating solutions at community level um, that actually respond to women's specific needs. Uh, and maybe to ask you a question, another example of that is, is in our private sector space where we apply the same approach. That then by definition requires private sector team to, to sort of proactively look for women's focused deals, if you like. I talked about one this morning, which was a, um, housing, green housing finance loan in India, which was 100% focused on lending to low-income women for mortgage to purchase green homes. Um, and that then, in order to implement that, then you need to have the systems um, in, in that partner bank to be able to reach women customers, develop the, the kind of modality, hire more women, develop more gender-inclusive workspaces. So those are kind of two examples of how we would work. Uh, but I would say it, it needs to really be be um, deliberately and intentionally built into the design and metrics of, of any kind of investment. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so uh, we talked about uh, our gender mainstreaming strategy, but the IMF has actually four new priorities. Uh, climate is, is a big mm. part of that. The digital is, is uh, the third one, and, and the fourth is fragile states. It all comes together at, at one level. So we've also uh, established uh, you know, a, a, a resilience uh, and sustainability trust, where uh, 
countries can access those, those resources. Mm. Uh, and as you know well, uh, you know, the way the IMF works is that we think of ourselves as a catalyst for private financing. So we are hoping private financing would come through, through that. Uh, now, I will confess that linking now gender and climate is on our to-do list. Mm -hmm. It is very much in our strategy, because the strategy, the, the strategy paper clearly states that we need to apply a gender lens on in climate, on digital, and in the fragile states. So you will see, hopefully, some work coming on that, looking at the big macro picture, looking at how to link the macro with gender and finance. Excellent, and stay tuned. And Rachel. Yes, sorry, gender and climate. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the question, and of course, for the important work you're leading on women's entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, you know, two, two pieces to add to what others have said. Um, the first on the climate question, you know, that is absolutely one of the priorities that we are focused on in this year. Um, and we've been working on this already. So I would point in particular to USAID's Engendering Industries Initiative, um, which actually began back in 2015 uh, and is now supported through our Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund. Um, which is focused on advancing women's economic participation globally with a, a particular lens on many of the, the pressing challenges we face in this moment, uh, whether it's COVID recovery or whether it's the climate crisis. Um, so, you know, that's a program that offers training to uh, folks in largely male-dominated industries, starting with the energy sector and now looking to other sectors to basically provide technical assistance as to how to diversify in those sectors. Um, and that program has already seen promising results, uh, which is why it's growing and why uh, it will expand into other sectors as well. Um, so you know, that type of effort is what we hope to see more of as we tackle this important issue. And on financing uh, for gender equality, you know, we couldn't agree more with the importance there, you know, we were really uh, gratified to go back to the fiscal year 24 budget ask to see the president make the largest request ever for financing for gender equality, uh, three more than three billion dollars, uh, and that uh, you know we'll see how Congress comes back. But that is certainly, I think, a strong statement about the importance that we see uh, with respect to investment in this as a priority to complement many of the strategies um, and diplomatic efforts that we are pursuing as well. And all power to you, Wendy, for leading this work yeah. <laughs> on, on, on financing uh, for women's businesses. Absolutely. All right, if I can just get a time check. All right, I'm going to close us out uh, by bringing us full circle, because we started with the Australian ambassador's remarks um, and we have a representative from her government here, Emma Wilson. So on this very critical intersection of gender and climate, Emma, if you want to share just a little bit from your perspective on how this will be championed by your government rolling into the spring meetings, okay. let's make sure you have a mic. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So we've heard a bit from our ambassador for gender equality um, on how we're going to champion this through APEC and the G20 this year, I'll just flag uh, a couple of other areas um, where Australia um, will be talking about this um, and promoting uh, particularly the gender climate nexus. So we're publishing two new strategies this year. The first one will be our new international development strategy. Um, and I would say half of it's focused on gender, the other half is focused on climate and a big portion of that uh, brings it together. Um, perhaps I'll divide it into thirds. So one third is focused on digital as well. Um, and uh, how gender kind of intersects with both, both of those uh, issues. We're also going to work on a new uh, international gender strategy. Um, and climate will feature quite heavily on that. Um, the head of Australia's uh, World Bank Springs delegation is um, our, our lead climate advocate, and he will also be coming 
uh, with a strong gender agenda. So we'll be here in April talking a lot about the link between gender and climate change. So more to come from the Australian government on the gender climate nexus this year. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Emma. And I think that sums this conversation yeah, up yeah. well, because as the ambassador and as Rachel kicked us off by saying, if we are to prioritize in the coming year to make some meaningful, concrete progress, if we're going to focus our energies on care, on digital, and on green jobs and the broader climate nexus, I think there is opportunity for alignment, collaboration across governments and multilateral institutions. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing how things develop and, and lend ourselves as a resource to support. So thank you all so much um, for making the trip to see us in person or tune in online. There is a reception in the back for those of you who are able to stay and chat uh, with one another. Please join me in thanking our fantastic speakers.